Right now I'm staring at a giant Right now I can't see past my pain Right now my songs have turned to silence And you've never seemed so far away But I still believe I still believe There's no heart you can rescue No war you can win No story so over It can't start again No pain you won't use No wall you won't break through It might be too much for me Church, if you uh, have not been here before, we want to give you an extra, extra special greeting. Um, let's take a few minutes now uh, and meet and greet those around us, get to know somebody we haven't met before, and uh, we'll have a couple more announcements after that. Go ahead and take a few minutes. Thanks, guys. <laughs>
if you'd all take your seats, I'd like to make a short announcement. Lou, time's down. <laughs> everybody, everybody enjoys visiting. You probably have noticed the display for Operation Christmas Child that's out in the foyer. And if you haven't, you need to look that way and notice that there are boxes for individual people to take and pack. There are items out there that gives you a suggestion of something that you might want to put in. Uh, an Operation Christmas Child shoebox. And in each box, there is an insert that tells you, gives you some more ideas, things that you could put in your Christmas box. Um, it also has a list of things. Please do not put these items in your box because when it gets to Denver, when they go through them, if there were toys, if there's liquid, they're going to take it all out. So please be mindful of that. I also wanted to tell you that um, you may not know that, that I fundraise all year long. And I hit up family members and friends, and then with that money, purchase items, I can get them in bulk. I'm a great sales shopper. And then we have a packing party, which we just finished, and we had around 400 boxes that we packed just for individual, individuals donating. We've, I know, isn't that great? Now, we've also had people that just couldn't wait. They, they've been shopping. They're, Good shoppers, I've told you shop all year long for those after Christmas sales, after Thanksgiving, and any sales like that. Well, you can't after Thanksgiving, so, well, I guess you could last year. Anyway, shop, get your things, stick them in a box somewhere. And so with the um, extra money that I've been handed that was over and above what we did on our packing boxes, we've already had 102 boxes turned in. In addition to the 400, so we, our goal is 600. We've already gotten 500. That means we only have to pack another 100 to meet our goal. So I would love to just break that goal and keep going. But um, I do want to tell you a little bit. Um, I'm sure most of you know what um, Operation Christmas Child is by now. I talk about it every year. But if you're visiting and don't know, Franklin Graham had this great idea for evangelism. And you know... <laughs> his heritage of evangelism from Billy Graham, it was to how to get people to hear the gospel. So he works with missionaries around the world, pastors in all these different countries. Um, he has Samaritan Purse workers, and they hand these boxes out as a way to get children to come in. Each box has a gospel message in it, in their own language. The gospel is provided at that time that they receive boxes, and any of them pray, that pray to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, um, they're encouraged to take the 12-week um, course, follow-up course, where they really can learn who Jesus was and who he is and what he means, what salvation means. And so now we're just going to have a little, about a two-minute video just to give you a little bit more of an idea about Operation Christmas Child. But I would encourage you to get a box, start thinking about the ages you want, Fill your box and you can turn it back anytime. I'd like to have them all back by the first week in November. I know we don't have to have them over to the um, distribution, Pagosa distribution center until a little later, but it would help us to have them in earlier. So just think, I got to get it in by the first of November, okay? Thank you.
Amen. What a wonderful ministry. Why don't we stand up, folks? We're going to start our worship time. We always like to start off with a prayer. My name is Bart. I'm the worship pastor here at Center Point. Welcome to you guys. If I haven't been able to catch you this morning and you're busy, let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you for this time of worship. Help us now, Lord, to focus on you. Now is about you, Lord God. Help us to glorify you in our worship. Help us to celebrate you, to be grateful and thankful for all that you've done. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's not your name You will always be much more than me And every day I wrestle with the voices that keep telling me I'm not right That's alright Cause I hear the voice and he calls me to deep And they'll say I'll never be enough And greater is the one living inside of me Than he Make it count, leave a mark, build a name for yourself. 
Dream your dreams, chase your heart above all else. Make a name the world remembers. Let all an empty world could sell as empty dreams. I got lost in the light, and it was up to me to make a name the world remembers. But Jesus is the only name to remember.
just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. transgressions and sins made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus.
His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faith.
Amen. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, worship team. Boy, you have heard a quick thumbnail summary of why we are gathered here this morning. It is to try to fathom somehow, some way, the indescribable love of our Savior for us. And I'm convinced the more I try to learn, the less I know. And the more often I come to the end of, of my ability to fathom, and my heart just kind of overflows with gratitude. And, uh, and I'm so excited to have the chance to be with you here yet again another Sunday to continue this quest to know this Jesus, this Savior, better. We promised you last week that we would have a video ready to show you this morning. For Main Street Bethlehem, it was going to be kind of the beginning, the kickoff to, to kind of illuminate and enlighten you, those that have never um, uh, been exposed to uh, a, a, a ministry like this, to help you get excited so that you would be sure to sign up as you leave. And uh, the problem is that most of you signed up last week, so there's, there's not a lot of slots left, but there are still plenty of opportunities to help, and, uh, and we've highlighted all of the uh, opportunities that are still out there. But because I promised, we're going, to, we're going to watch some of the video this morning, give you a little taste and a flavor of Main Street Bethlehem, which is our December outreach to our community and surrounding communities with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So watch just a little bit with me this morning.
Okay, John, would you uh, take the volume down? I'm going to keep talking while you keep watching. Um, as you can tell, it takes place in the sanctuary. We set up booths and shops and money changer temp, uh, a table and a census place where you sign in, pay your taxes. Um, everyone in costume and character doing all we can to make you feel like you have gotten into a time machine and gone back to the first century Bethlehem. A um, lot of interaction between the cast and uh, the visitors. And, you know, we've had hundreds and hundreds of folks pass through in the three years that we've done this before. And always the same thing, um, the same reaction, the same response is they are just thrilled, as some of them have even told us, to begin their Christmas tradition with their families with attending Main Street Bethlehem. To try to get the season started off right with a focus on what the season is really all about. This year it will be on December 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Uh, it will go from, I think, 6 to 7.30. And, uh, and it's just a wonderful opportunity for us to engage with those who come with hopefully the opportunity to share the reason why we are doing this, the reason for the season, the birth of the Savior, and the promise of the salvation that was offered because of Jesus' birth. Many opportunities for you to get involved. Many opportunities, if nothing more, than for you just to remember to pray for us as we're setting up for most of the month of November and then as we are taking care of those three very important nights. Um, it's something that we love to do. It's something that um, God has blessed in the past. And, uh, and we are already beginning to pray for those who will come through. And especially for those who do not know the gospel, they do not know the Savior, that as a result of even just brushing shoulders with some shopkeepers or maybe even petting the donkey or the goats or the, uh, the other animals that will be present here in the sanctuary, that, that something will spark their curiosity and their interest and they will want to know more. And we will more than... Uh, be willing to take up uh, that opportunity to share with them. So this is what it's all about. And uh, we'll go ahead and fade out now. It kind of goes on for um, a little bit longer, but much the same as we have been watching. And we want to turn now our attention to our time together in God's Word. So let's just take a moment and, uh, and bow our heads in prayer. Father, we are grateful that you give us so many outlets for the creativeness that you've placed within us. We're so grateful that there are those who are much more creative than we are. We thank you for the vision. We thank you for the hard work that has gone in these past years to Main Street. A ministry that has been going on for decades in, in this church, at least way back before we were here. And then you brought Mike and Rena here to to just take it to a whole new level. We thank you for them and for all that they have led us, Lord, in in its development and growth. And even now as we look forward to this year, we pray that you would prepare our hearts and prepare the hearts of those that will walk through, that there would be those who would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior as a result. And Lord, if, if you would be pleased that we might have the privilege to know that, to hear that, to be encouraged with that. We would be so appreciative. We thank you for the many ministries of Centerpoint and for all of our folks that serve and, and find joy in, in their expression of worship to you in that way. We just pray, Lord, that we would do a better job of worshiping you through our lives and through our testimonies and through our actions. Father, we pray that you would even now Quiet our hearts in your presence, that you would prepare us for the word, the seed that you want to plant in us this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would give us hearts to understand, that you would give us minds that, that would be willing to, to work, to try to process the incredible God that you are. We ask for your blessing on our time together. We ask that you would be the teacher we ask, Lord, that I would just fade to the background and that you would be the one who we see and who we hear. Father, we have so many 
folks with us this morning, friends, special guests and visitors. We have folks that come with, with needs and burdens right now. I'm thinking of Byron's mom in uh, Guatemala that's not doing very well. We just we hold her up before you, Lord. We pray that you would be with her, that you would draw her to yourself, and Lord, that you would touch her body, restore her health according to your will, that you would be glorified in her life, and that you would even use this as an opportunity to, to encourage and challenge and bless the whole family in a way that only you can do. Lord, many other requests that we have, many other burdens that we carry, I pray that our time together in your word would encourage your people. We leave it with you. We trust you with it, Lord. You are a great God. We love you, and we'll ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we began uh, quite a few weeks ago with a simple three-verse passage in Matthew chapter 11. That great invitation where, just taken out of context, it just sounds like Jesus being Jesus and just inviting everybody to come to him. And yet what we don't oftentimes stop to really ponder is the fact that he's describing his heart to us. And in all the New Testament, it's probably the only place where Jesus really speaks to who he is in this sense and what his heart really is all about. You know the verses, Come unto me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And yet in the context of where this falls in Matthew and when we realize that he's just not in the too distant past of, the, of that book, he's, he's really challenged religious leaders with their unbelief. He's, he's tried to present himself as the light of the world. And, and uh, with all of those who refuse to believe, his heart being heavy, it's almost as if he just stops in the midst of all of this unbelief and he just throws out this, this invitation, just, just come to me. Come to me. So with that as the backdrop, in the beginning, we began to look at this incredible heart. And these next bullet part points, these next slides that I will you know, share with you, really are just almost every slide is one of our weeks of study with a new point, a new revelation about this incredible Savior that we know and love and worship. And yet making us realize that we don't even begin to know him as well as we could or should or want to. So to those who will come to him, to those who belong to him, he is the gentle and lowly, the patient and accessible, the kind and forgiving Savior. In a book that I've recommended to you more than once, Dane Ortland gentle and lowly. He describes Jesus this way, tender, open, welcoming, accommodating, understanding, willing. And that's what that lowly in heart really refers to. It's, a, it's really a reference to the fact that he is accessible. Same word used when Mary was, was thanking the Lord that he had chosen, chosen her to bear the Messiah. And the, and the comparison was just simply, you didn't choose the high and lofty people. You chose the lowly, the rejected, the spurned, the despised. And Jesus identifies himself with that group. He might be a king, but the first time he came, he did not come as king. He came as a lowly, peasant, pauper, carpenter's son. Uh, The next point, we have to remind ourselves that this offer, though, is only for those who will come to him. This offer of gentleness, this offer of tenderness, this offer of mercy is only for those that will come to him, to those who reject his mercy, forgiveness, an invitation to become family. His wrath is real, it's full, it's ferocious, and it's eternal. 
And I think one of the reasons why we struggle to understand the depth of his tenderness for us is because it's so hard for us to imagine the ferocity of his wrath towards sin. We reminded ourselves that Jesus willingly and voluntarily saddled himself with every aspect of humanity except sin so that he could completely empathize with us in our daily lives. This burden, this connection, this permanent experience makes him a merciful and faithful high priest on our behalf. It causes him to know exactly what we are feeling, suffering through, being tempted with every day of our lives. And for those times, especially when we feel like he is a million miles away and his heart is somehow not touched by our pain, we reminded ourselves a few weeks ago that his heart hurts more than ours when he sees the suffering that is going on in us and around us. We also were reminded that forgiving our sin, rescuing us from death, restoring us to fellowship and intimacy brings him a joy that we just can't understand and probably very often do not think about. You know, I'm I'm going slowly and each one of these is a thought that takes a lot longer than 15 seconds to ponder. These are incredible statements about our Savior. This is his heart. This is who he is. This is what he loves to do. We might even say that if you poke him or cut him, this is what comes out. And sometimes it's so foreign to our thoughts about him. And that's why I'm reviewing all of these over and over and over again. This role of savior and intercessor prompts him to invest himself in interceding for us whenever he's not busy or whenever he feels like it or whenever he has nothing else to do. No, no, always. He always is interceding for us. He prays more for you than you do. His ongoing ministry to us and for us is a direct result of his promise to never, ever, ever cast us out. And there is nothing that you can do that will cause him to disown you as his child. Once you have accepted his invitation and you've come to him, And you've surrendered your life to him. You are his for eternity. So because of all of these things, he invites us to step into his yoke with him. Remember, his his yoke is kind. It's kind because it was tailor-made for you. He knows exactly the kind of yoke you need to step into to deal with your issues and your baggage and your weaknesses. It's also light, especially when you compare it with the burden of sin, which grows increasingly heavy and will only pull you down into death and hell. And then the part that so many of you have mentioned to me that you love so far best of all is that he steps in to the other side of that yoke. And he pulls with you. And he encourages you all along the way. And when you can no longer pull, he just reaches out and he puts his arm around you. And the both of you continue on together, whether your feet are touching the ground or not. That is our incredible Savior. But just to remind ourselves, he can only rescue those who come to him 
He can only begin this life-changing relationship with those who turn to him. He can only bestow the privilege of becoming family on those who come to him, who take his yoke, and who learn of him. Why are we in the midst of the study? Why are we continuing week after week to, to try to sneak in just one more? There's so many to choose from. I don't know which ones to leave out. We initially said, well, the main reason is we want to understand his heart better because it's going to cause us to love him more. It's going to cause us to want to serve him with more passion, more excitement, more enthusiasm. But even after this week, I was reminded of a whole other reason why it is that we really want to continue on in this study and to learn more about him. It's so simply this, we might not wait so long when we need to run to him. Because we're afraid of how he's going to respond. Because we're afraid of what he might be thinking. Because we're afraid of, of the fact that we might see a scowl and not a smile. And yet, Scripture reveals to us that there's nothing that's further from the truth. When we are tempted to sin or defeated by sin, wherever we are along that pathway, that that timeline, that continuum, wherever we are, the sooner we turn and run to Jesus, the happier he will be, the happier we will be, and the more quickly our sin will be put away, destroyed, wiped out, and we will be restored to that place of sonship and daughtership that intimate fellowship that we love and crave with him. So again, I've I've got to add one more this morning. We've got to to do another one. And this is one that I've not thought about. I'm not a big Puritan reader. And so a lot of these thoughts taken from their writings are, are new to me. And yet so many of them have been such an encouragement. And so the next one we share with you is just simply this, that our sin draws out his compassionate heart even more toward us. And that might be the opposite of what you would expect. He's the Holy One. He can't bear to look upon sin. He can't bear to be around sin. And and so our natural human understanding would be when we sin, He recoils in horror. He has to step back. He has to move away. He has to leave the room. And yet Scripture tells us that's not his response to those that have come to him for salvation. But that our sin literally causes his heart even more to reach out to us with empathy and sympathy, with our pain and our sadness and our sorrow, and with this overwhelming desire on his part to heal and to restore us back to that place from which we have fallen. And yet sometimes we wait hours or days or weeks, sometimes years before we come back to him because of the fear of what he's going to say. A passage in the Old Testament, just to give you an idea of what Yahweh God's feeling toward all of the sin And the rebellion of his children might look like. Hosea is a great book. Um, It's filled with unusual um, images of a prophet who married a woman who would not be faithful to him. In order that Israel might be able to see through his horrible marriage what the heart of God feels like when they chase after other gods. And in chapter 11, uh, you know, the Lord is saying to Israel, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. And yet the more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in 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 my arms by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. And I bent down 
to them and I fed them. And all of these images of a father with a small child. And you can imagine, you've probably been the one holding the little guy or the little girl as they were learning to take their first steps. Eating together, feeding them, holding them, loving on them, protecting them. Doing whatever needed to be done so they could be healed from their cold or their sniffles or from their tummy ache or whatever it might be. That was God with Israel. And yet we jump down to verse 7 and he says this, my people are bent on turning away from me. They've determined that's just going to be the direction they're going to go. And it seems like throughout the Old Testament, the more, G, uh, the more God loved them, the more they turned away from him. So look at what he says in verse 8. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? It's just another name for Israel. How can I hand you over, O Israel? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. Surprise. It's not the response that you're expecting. You're expecting wrath. You're expecting anger. You're expecting harshness. And this chapter does include discipline, but it's not so much the, the punishment that we see God accomplishing as it is the drawing of his children to him. And then I love this. In verse 9, he says, I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst. And I will not come in wrath. I'm not a man who loses his temper. I'm not a man who allows his emotions that have been twisted by the fall to lead me to response in anger. The more you sin and the more you turn away, Israel, the more my heart is broken and the more my compassion warms toward you. And I remember helping you to walk and, and feeding you and loving you. And so therefore, even though I am the Holy One, I will not come in wrath. And though we see the wrath of God poured out so many times in Old Testament passages on unbelievers and disciplinary action on the children of Israel, this is the heart of God even in the Old Testament. What about a New Testament passage? Romans chapter 5, just a short little phrase. Verse 20 says this, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. This is taken in a passage where, where Paul is just introducing the fact that the law was given to increase sin, which sounds really weird. But what Paul meant was the law was given so that people would not be able to ignore how desperately they needed a Savior. Because when the law was given and it said, don't do this, you had to understand that the thing you wanted to do more than anything else was exactly what you had just been told not to do. It exposed the wickedness of your heart, the depravity of your heart. It helped you to see the, the helplessness and the hopelessness of your situation. And so even though it, it might have exposed more and more and more sin, and maybe in many respects caused more and more and more sin, the purpose was so that the Savior, in offering salvation from that sin, would be recognized by those who had finally come to understand how hopelessly lost they were. And then... He gets to this place and he says, but in the midst of all of this, because of the law, because of the increase of sin, it didn't overwhelm the plan. It didn't, it didn't train wreck the plan because where sin increased, it says literally grace superabounded. 
And here we have, again, this, this representation of the heart of God. Because grace is not a thing that you store in a vault somewhere. It, it, it's not in a warehouse. It's, it's not in a place like an ATM machine where you go and, and pick up a few pounds of grace. Grace is always connected to a person. The grace and the forgiveness and the mercy that you and I experience never, ever, ever is experienced apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, which is verse 21. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life. And all of that is found in Jesus Christ our Lord. So this thought, this idea that the Puritans love to just think about and talk about and write about, to them was kind of put in these words, when we sin, the very heart of Christ is drawn out to us. Can you just, just chew on that for a while? When you sin, yes, it might be rebellious sin. It might be intentional sin. It might be in your face sin. It might be sin out of anger or frustration or weakness. It might be the time that you were tricked or trapped or blindsided. You weren't prepared. You were weak. You were tired. You were hungry. You were whatever. And all of a sudden, you find yourself in this horrible mess that you've created. And it's in those moments that our human mind would tell us, well, God's the last person you can run to. He won't understand. He's so sick and tired of your failures that he's not going to give you the least amount of grace. You've, you've overspent your grace. You've used it all up. And all of these other thoughts that go through our mind. And yet Romans 5.20 tells us that where sin abounds, where sin increases, it's at that very place, that very point where God's grace super abounds. There is no sin that you can be caught up in. There is no sin that you can be guilty of that is too great or too big or committed too often for the grace of Jesus Christ to overwhelm and wash away. So as we try to apply this to our lives, as we try to grab onto this truth and, and just Hang on as we ride through life trying to understand what does this mean? Again, some more thoughts that go along with this. This compassionate heart of Christ will cause Jesus to do many things. Number one, it will cause him to run to our aid. To rescue us from the sin that so easily besets us or tri trips us up, or traps us, or defeats us. Whatever it is. Whatever it involves. However ugly it is. And messy it is. We need to understand that, that Jesus Christ is not recoil recoiling in horror. He is not looking for a way to get out of the picture. He is looking for the pathway to get to your side, to help you in this situation. And it causes him to focus all his attention and his energy on destroying the sin that is ruining you and me. And this illustration that uh, Dane uses in his book that is so very helpful, it's, it's the idea of a doctor, the top of his field, who has a son who is dying of the very disease that he's a specialist in. And with the same heart and passion and tireless study, 
that doctor will literally give every last breath of his life to do whatever it takes to make sure that his son does not die with this disease. And do you see Jesus like that doctor? He gave his last breath to secure the treatment that was required to save you from the sin that is killing you. And so when you are relapsing and when you are falling again into the pit, there is no frustration on Jesus' part. There is no disappointment. There is no shrugging of the shoulders or rolling of the eyes or sighing audibly. Here we go again. Because you are his son. You are his daughter. And sin is trying to ruin, ruin you. And he is on a mission to finish what he started in you so that he will not let that happen. It causes him to stand against the accusations that the evil one is bringing against us. And by the way, they all might be founded and totally true. And that doesn't matter. Because Jesus will stand up and the next one he will plead with his father on our behalf. Not because the father is against us, but just simply because the son is so much for us. And find such great joy in forgiving us and restoring us and enjoying us. causes Jesus to break the hold that sin has on us. And literally, it's his resurrection from the dead that was that death blow to sin. I mean, I, I know that we continue to sin. And I know that's part of our fallen nature, and it's part of what we've come to experience. But so much of what we do is just simply because We've been deceived again into thinking that we really don't have a choice. Or deceived into thinking that this brings us more joy than what the option would be. It's a lie. It's not true. One day we'll see it. One day we'll get it. One day we'll understand it. But death has been defeated. Sin has been defeated. It no longer controls us. Romans yeah, 5, 6, 7, 8, those chapters are just incredible on discussing this point. Though we still struggle, sin is dead. And then, just the last one this morning, is that it causes Christ to restore us to the fellowship and the intimacy of a cherished son or daughter in his family. Need another verse for some more encouragement? 1 John 2, 1. My little children, I'm writing to you these things so that you may not sin. And, and that verse would be enough. That would be a verse that would stand on its own. That's the reason the word of God has been given to us, to help us in our struggle against and in our battle with sin. But what, what else comes is incredible. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The advocate is different than the intercessor. The intercessor is kind of in between praying, you know, praying for us and preparing, if you will, the Father for us. But the advocate moves over to our side and he puts his arm around us and he says, come on, let me take you to the judge. I'll go with you. I'll talk. You just stand there. Oh, by the way, did I tell you he's my dad? We're in a, we're in a, we got a really good relationship. And he advocates for us. 
And I've said many times, I, I don't know what he's saying about me, but I'm afraid there's times when he says things to his father like, yeah, I know, Dad, I know. John knows better. Good grief, he's old enough. <laughs> Good grief, he's been saved long enough. But he messed up again. He's still weak, and he's still childish. But Daddy's mine. I bought him with my blood. I paid for his sin. He just hasn't yet completely figured out who he is. And the judge will say, okay, I see the scars. I see that he's dressed in your clothes. I see that your name is tattooed on his forehead. I see him as though he never sinned. So we'll throw this case out. How about Romans 8, 31? What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? This next verse is really the, the, really the relevant one. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Well, it's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was the one who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. He's not going to condemn us. But will our sin and will our messiness keep him from loving us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? Nope. For as it is written, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our sin doesn't push him away. Our sin draws out even that much more sympathy and empathy from his heart toward us. Which leads me to just close with the question. If you don't know this Savior, you are missing out on absolutely the best part of life on earth. And maybe today's the day that you would come to him because your burden is so heavy you can't go on any longer. That you would be willing to take his yoke upon you that you would be willing to learn of him, that you would be willing to allow him to make you his child. Let's pray. Father, we are humbled in your presence, struggling to understand how you could love us this much, how you could be so patient with us, how the very things that we think make us ugly to you as we are learning, in a sense, make us even more attractive to you because it gives to you even more opportunity to shower on us the love and the forgiveness and the cleansing, the grace and the mercy that you died to be able to provide to us. Forgive us for misunderstanding you. Forgive us for painting you to be something that you are not. Forgive us for being so callous toward those who will understand your wrath in a most ferocious way because they have not yet allowed you to become their God. Lord, you know the folks that are here this morning. You know everyone by name. You know those that belong to you. You know those who have not accepted you. 
Lord, would you move in the hearts of those that are without Christ today? Would you not let them leave without making sure that they have surrendered to your gracious lordship? That they have taken upon themselves the yoke that is so kind and so light when compared to what they're carrying right now. Would you make this the day of their salvation? Would you accomplish for them what you set your heart to accomplish in them since the day that they were born? And with eyes closed, heads bowed, I have to ask this morning, is there somebody here? That would say, PJ, you're talking to me this morning. I've never submitted to Jesus. I've never surrendered to him. But boy, after listening to the kind of God that he is, I I can't wait to do that. Would you just raise your hand so we can pray for you this morning? Is there just even one person? Well, Lord, you know whether... A hand was raised outwardly or just in the heart. You saw it, even if I didn't. I would love to think it means that every single person in this auditorium is bought, sealed, and just waiting to be delivered to heaven. But Lord, if that's not the case, would you continue to do your work? Would you continue to accomplish your will? And would you stir us all up that we might do more to share this incredible God with others. As we share our story, as we tell how God graciously forgave us, our prayers that you would use our simple story to draw others to the Savior. Lord, we love you. We are so humbled by you. We can't wait to see you face to face. And we ask that as we go today that your spirit would continue to minister, to speak to us in a very real way. And that the screams and cries of the football stadiums and all the other things that will vie for our attention this afternoon would not be able to overcome your voice. Reminding us how much you love us and how anxious you are to walk with us and to restore us every time we struggle with sin or completely fall into it. Dismiss us with your blessing. Give us grace, Lord, for the week that lies ahead. May your spirit go with us as we surrender each day to you. We love you and we thank you for our time together now in Jesus' name. Thanks so much for being here this morning. Would love to visit with you if we can help in any way. You're dismissed.